Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. I love that, by the way. You spraying someone with water? I just love that kind of stuff. I think it's hilarious. Like from the bench, that's um, that's big. Like Red Wings stealing Colorado Avalanche sticks that had just fallen on the ice from their side. My favorite is still when Corey Perry filled Jeff Carter's glove with water yeah. as he was as it was just sitting there. That's just incredible content. <laughs> that's so good. And that would suck. Yeah. Oh yeah. It would destroy your your day. Oh, you, oh what you... he barely sprayed him. It wasn't like a. A splash zone. <laughs> it wasn't like a splash. It was a, yeah, it was just a pass, pass, a flyby. They need to, uh, I mean, if you're getting paid, if you're getting fined five grand, you need to figure out what your money's worth. You can either, sp- you can either spear someone in the face or lightly miss them with water. There's no in between. <laughs> Leon Drysaddle has like a, like a medieval weapon at this point with how many people he's speared on the inside of their legs. <laughs> and I don't think he's gotten fined, so. Either he needs to switch to a water bottle or Jamie Ben needs to switch to a spear. But knowing what Jamie Ben has done on the ice, I would advise him to – I would advise Dry Settle to switch instead. Yeah, someone would die. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Jamie Jamie Ben does not need medieval weapons, which is a line I was absolutely expecting to stay, say at the start of this episode. It's – uh well, it's not pre-8 a.m. We'll say that. It's close. It's close. You know how Evan's ideal state is like – Curled up on a on a couch with a hoodie, hood up, holding his mic however he wants. Mm, which yeah, she, ha- which she has done. Those are good old days. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm feeling that energy today. <laughs> Bright and early, Winged Wheel Podcast. What is, what what's the name we thought of for this Winged Wheel Podcast? There was something and it after was after dark, before dark, Winged Wheel Podcast before dawn. I don't know. There was something good. I remember it. Well, I clearly don't. But If it, <laughs> if it was clever, <laughs> we weren't worthy of it anyways. No. <laughs> uh, welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk to you about the Red Wings and also bring you a very fun interview uh, with a returning guest. I'm Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. Um, in here just previously was Abby, not the former Red Wings player, my my dog. Uh, who has spent the better part of the last 24 hours off her damn gourd with how high she was from the sedatives from the vet. Uh, she would have been a, she would have been a great podcast guest host yesterday, but unfortunately she saw these guys and uh, spurred some energy in her today. Uh, on this episode of the winged wheel podcast, uh, we are here to talk to you about uh, the Detroit Red Wings and their most recent game at Madison Square Garden, where Thomas Grice apparently has a vendetta against the Rangers and it turns into a completely different goalie. <laughs> Not that he was bad before, but just like, whoa. Um, we're also going to bring you an interview with a uh, former Swedish uh, national team head coach and current Zurich Lions head coach, Ricard Gronberg. Um, one That's of not how you pronounce it. No, it's not. And <laughs> I'm absolutely you. You can wait to hear the interview because once he says it, you'll understand why I can't even begin to attempt. It's it. not physically possible. No, it's like the uh, the end boss of Large's um, pronunciations for us <laughs> that he gives us as a test. Uh, and then we are going to be chatting about that interview for a little bit, and then we'll be talking about what's happened in the world world of the NHL because. Uh, a little bit has happened. Those trades are starting to kick up. And then whatever else we get into before overtime. Before we do that, I uh, want to talk to you about Winged Wheel Podcast Night at the LCA. Uh, it's an event that we first put on last year in November. Yes, it was November, um, where we have partnered with the Detroit Red Wings to host an event in the arena before a game. Uh, so what we do is we set up, we're in the uh, Budweiser Beer, gar- beer Garden, we buy tickets, uh, you come out, we're going to have some food out there for you guys, a little bit of food, and then um, a bar will be open for uh, drinks, and then mix and mingle and meet the podcast hosts if you want, or even more importantly, uh, meet Ken Daniels, Mickey Redman might come through again, and then um, we're going to try to have some other special guests. Prashant Iyer, I heard, is going to make the trip, which is... Uh, more importantly, is his son coming? I actually, we need to ask him that. Prashant, is your son coming? Please respond. Uh, we, Does he have tips for hair? I just, yes. As someone whose hair is falling out at a rapid pace, yes. Also, he needs those giant baby headphones because those are hysterical. 
We had, uh, we had Meek at a game with those on in Detroit. It's cute. Mix and mingle, uh, meet the hosts, and then we are actually going to do a live episode of the podcast from the arena before the game. We all go watch the game. We have tickets in different sections. If you want to watch from the gondola, we have that. This time we have the lower bowl, and then we have some upper bowl mixed in as well. After the game, we have uh, an after party slash um, post game meetup. More food, more drinks, more time to hang out. It's a good time. That's when we kind of crank it up another level. Yeah. Yeah, it got weird. We have a hydration plan this time. <laughs> it's all business. Sure we do, Ryan. It's sure mostly business and pleasantries at the game, and then afterwards it, it's kind of the podcast after dark. Yes. Probably the best way of describing <laughs> it. <laughs> yes, that is absolutely podcast after dark. Yeah, walking through the outskirts of Detroit at like one in the morning with a group of people you barely know, always a good time. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's game time. Or I don't think you knew where you were, so it didn't matter. I didn't need to. I had you guys, I had Mel. I knew it was in good hands. Yeah. Uh, don't forget, Ryan, the tickets for this event are discounted. Oh, yes. Oh, I yeah. Keep, oh, was... <laughs> I forgot to mention that last time. And then we, I remember we're like, we definitely need to mention that. Yeah. We did not. Yes. The tickets are discounted. So whether you're in the lower bowl, gondola, whatever, they are uh, discounted tickets. And most importantly, a portion of every tickets, the proceeds go to the Jamie Daniels Foundation, uh, founded by Ken Daniels and Lisa Daniels Goldman. Um it's a, a fantastic organization that we're very, very proud to support. And honestly, the heart and soul behind these charity initiatives. So um, you're supporting a good cause. You're going out to a Red Wings game. You're having a good time. And um, if you think that mine or Evan's face is especially punchable, you can come out and, uh, well, don't punch us. But, you know, a light slap has been known to have been abideable those games i didn't say you this time brad i feel bad that we beat up on you while you weren't here for the interview with ken <laughs> it was ken's idea <laughs> yes ken's <laughs> idea wingwheelpodcast.com slash blog uh check out the post for all more information in the link or the link to buy tickets is in the description of this episode and honestly plastered everywhere so get your tickets soon they've i think we're already over 100 of them sold so get them fast okay um the detroit red wings walked into Madison Square Garden and met the brick wall whose name is Igor Shesterkin. Holy is that guy good. He is very good. Uh, he's no Thomas Grace, but he's really good. <laughs> I heard, like on the broadcast, they, they talked about Grace's stats against the Rangers, either specifically in MSG or against the Rangers. And I was like, whoa, like why? That's just the team that he decides that he's going to beat that day. I think wasn't Jimmy Howard the same way against the Rangers? It just must be MSG. Something about the arena. At least Jimmy had the excuse of he was kind of from the area. Yeah, right. Kind of like a hometown thing for him. But no, it was um, Grace has had a fantastic record against the Rangers, and this game was no different at all. Oh yeah, the Red Wings were very very good for about ten minutes, and then um, oh man, the Oracle on Twitter it went off the shits. <laughs> Uh, was the best way of putting it. It was an entertaining game because the defense for both teams looked like they had no idea what they were doing. Ah, oh, so it's a Red Wings hockey game. Hell yeah. Well, no, for once it wasn't just us, though. That was a pleasant plot twist. It was a it was a game where I don't think at many points Detroit looked like the better team, but even when they weren't, they didn't look significantly worse on balance. There weren't a lot of moments where the Red Wings were outclassed, but when they were, it was obvious and prolonged. Like, they would get buried by the Panarin line in their own end for like a minute straight, and Grace would have to make four or five bell saves. Like, Which he did. Oh, he did. He very much did. But, uh, yeah, it was um, a very, very sloppy game overall from both teams. But it was fun. Like, it was a fun one to watch. Bad hockey equals good hockey. It because does. Because it means screw-ups, and screw-ups mean chances. If both teams are playing bad hockey, it means it's a fun game to watch. Yeah. So, the scoring actually opened with Troy Stetcher, who is barely back from injury and, and got his first goal, which is really good to see. Yeah. His first goal, which uh, puts him in a tie for third amongst defensemen and goals on this team. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and he had uh, just passed Danny DeKaiser. Oh, God. <laughs> but then Danny DeKaiser made uh, that smart play to bounce off the back of the boards. 
I, I sent out a tweet saying like Danny definitely did that on purpose, and I think most of the people took that as sarcasm. No, he actually he, he actually it. meant to do yeah. it. He's done it before. Like, and it's, <laughs> it doesn't have to be Joe Louis Arena's boards. Like they those weren't the only live the only lively boards in the world. Like, I hate when all they do is talk about stuff like that <laughs> on a broadcast. It's just like one thing, and then that's what they drill for the rest of the you know, yeah. time. Or it's like we're playing in this arena and they like, like, what are we going to talk about? And they're like lively boards. And then they love talking about that. I, I don't know. And they just underline it four times. Nothing else happened ever at the Jolus arena. So yeah, nothing, not mm-hmm. one notable thing. No. Um, and so that was cider to Dick Heiser who made that play. And then, you know, a couple of good, I think one or two good deflections made it to Larkin who buried it home. So Larkin has, I think about a trillion goals on the year. That's mm-hmm. what it is now. Mm hmm. He continued rolling. Most important part of that play, though, was the cross-ice pass to Danny DeKaiser by Mo Sider to continue to add to his totals. Who then... Wasn't very cool, though. No. No. But you know what was cool? Goading uh, Chris Kreider into coming at him. <laughs> Le- upper body leaning backwards kind of slowed because you think you had this rookie lined up, so you're not really bracing yourself. And just nailing him with a reverse hit. Kreider's a big boy, too, I think. He's huge, yeah. That wasn't even Mo Sider's most impressive reverse hit of the game. It just was the most visually, we'll call it aesthetically pleasing one. It was, yeah. Ryan Reeves took a run at Sider in the neutral zone in the first period, and he didn't drop Reeves like he dropped Kreider, but Reeves just kind of bounced off of him. And Those hurt. Those are way worse than getting yeah. run over. And Ryan Reeves is a Big boy. So I, you mentioned that and I actually went back and watched it, and I think it was a mixture of a couple of things. Sider braced, like saw yeah. him coming, and yeah. like like you said, was set up to not hit, throw him, it but... back, but like stand tall. Yeah. And I think Reeves rolled himself off of Sider, and the camera panned away, so it's hard to tell. But I think Sider felt it still. Oh, he. When you get hit by Ryan Reeves, there's no way you don't feel it. If you didn't feel it, it means you're out cold. That's why. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's a if if Kreider's a big boy, then Ryan Reeves is a mountain. Yeah. <laughs> so the actual hit on Kreider, though, it was Kreider ended up kind of on his ass. Surprise! Everyone was just like, "Oh man, that looked hilarious." Let's see the close up, and you look at the close up, and it's Sider intentionally keeping his eyes forward while setting for the reverse hit. And if you watch the play, you know that Sider obviously did it on purpose. But then um, Ice Hockey Gifts, our friend on Twitter, um, sent us a video of Sider teaching someone how to do exactly that play. So this is this is one of his moves. He did it intentionally. And I just love the fact that Sider is, you know, 50-odd games into his NHL career and fooled a massive veteran NHL player who is also one of, like, the leading scorers in the NHL this year into just walking into that trap. Even if the Red Wings lost, that's all we need for those games. Do we have something that we can fawn over more at Cider about and just play on loop for three weeks? Great. The Red Wings win. Thank you. President's Trophy Champions is here by uh, by that metric. The Red Wings? Yeah. If by if That's a good fan duel bet. Not bad. <laughs> Did Mort Cider do something cool today? Put money on it. Doesn't matter what the odds yeah. are. Also, uh, Raymond had another I think it was on Lindgren where he oh, yeah. really out muscled him, threw him into the boards. Oh yeah, that was a big hit. I don't- as a <clears throat> as a defenseman, oh god! <laughs> I saw what Lindgren did, and I saw how he got out muscled. I'm like, oh, that's rough. By all five foot ten of Lucas Raymond. Yeah, I think Lindgren did actually knock over more at Cider later on in the game, which was a little bit of redemption. But yeah, the way he went into the boards and how he got out muscled was uh, was something. Yeah, for over uh, for a relatively underwhelming game overall from the Red Wings, there were a lot of highlights in that. Yeah, um, like Mark Stahl got his big tribute video from the Rangers, right? Which was fun. Biggest fans Zendaya and Tom Holland were there. Yeah, well, that's what I'm piecing together here because now there's a reality in which Spider Man and MJ in the MCU think Mark Stahl is the greatest hockey player alive. Like, wow, <laughs> this guy must have had a great career. Yeah. <laughs> Storied NHL career. Mark Stahl is the GOAT. Yeah. <laughs> in the Marvel Cinematic Universe now. <laughs> I only know who Tom Holland is, is because he was on Hot Ones. That is the most Evan statement I've heard in my entire life. 
I'm just so I don't even go and see the superhero movies, but I'm so superheroed out. That's incredible. I, 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 I what else is he in? That's notable. That's right. You're not wrong. Thank you. Actually, he's uncharted. New, yeah, which oh my god, have you seen it? No, but I saw the commercials. I was like, they they ruined this. I just don't watch. I just keep playing the games. Yeah, if Mark Wahlberg is your your main star, that is not good. Nathan Fillion was right there. He was right there. <sighs> um, yeah, the the Zendaya and Tom Holland got to watch the wonder that is the Detroit Red Wings, led by none other than Mark Stahl <laughs> in the game. So hold on, I can tie this all back together with Evan's question. Tom Holland was in a movie called Chaos Walking. Not nah. how fitting with Mark Stahl being the that, goat. That's in his what world. happens when the Red Wings defense start going across the blue line. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Stahl stepping in from the blue line with the puck down the boards. That's chaos walking. Uh, <laughs> Everything Mark Stahl does. You talk, Brad, you talked about, you know, this game having a lot of highlights. So I think the next notable thing that happened was Giovanni Smith hit um, uh, Gauthier from behind. Which I saw that hit. I'm like, ah, I'd be livid if that was a Red Wings player. I, I'm not. I do not blame the Rangers for being mad, and I don't blame Dryden Hunt for um, stepping up and dropping the gloves with Giovanni Smith. Giovanni Smith won that one handily. I well, got, sometimes that's not the, the price you pay. You're not the big guy who's yeah. got to drop the gloves. You're the closest guy. <laughs> sometimes you're not that guy, but you're the only guy. So you yeah. you just have to take your lumps. Um, but the game in overtime, overtime was wild. OT was insane, but it featured what I honestly think might be the Red Wings play of the season. And I know in a year where Raymond and Sider have done everything that they've done in Bertuzzi and, you know, all the notable plays that we've had, but Dylan Larkin coming back against Artemi Panarin with 20 seconds left in OT. That whole sequence is insane. Yeah. That pass from Shesterkin oh, is ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> from his, was he on his knees? Yeah, he made the that save and then he got on his – I think he was on his knee, like down on one knee and then fired it. Let me see here. Yes. Yeah, one knee and then launches a perfect outlet pass for yeah. a Panarin breakaway. Dylan Larkin, you know, not at the start of a shift going full speed to stop Panarin. And then the thing is, you know, doing something at full speed without taking the penalty is hard because you have way less control when you're skating at 100%. But look what Larkin does. Like he he perfectly reads it. Like Panarin thought he had a, his had him body blocked on the one side, and and, then and Larkin kind of just cuts over and takes away the stick. It's master class. It's the reverse deke. I'm going to show you this way, and then you go the other way. Except he did it without the puck. I, yeah, I've to never the puck. <laughs> I've never seen someone deke someone when they were the one without the puck. That was an incredible play. Faked one side, cut over, tied up the stick, moved the puck, almost scored on his own net, but didn't. <laughs> and then actually, you know, almost set up the play going down the other way. That was – when that happened, I'm like, that almost saved the game. That, that potentially is a game saver for Detroit, and that ended up being the case. I mean, yeah, if you're the New York Rangers with 20 seconds left and you've got Artemi Panarin on a breakaway, you take that 10 out of 10 times. Oh, my God. I just – it is just such an incredible play. That is – that will go on Larkin's career highlight reel. Yeah, until they start making the playoffs. Until they start making the playoffs, you're right. That's on his Selkie reel. Yeah, you know what? Larkin's not – oh, I think we joked about this last episode. It's Bergeron or whoever this year, but Larkin, Larkin's going to get there, man. Shootout, Lucas Raymond, now a 50% uh, shooter. And uh, who was it? Pew Suter. Who wanted it? Pew Suter, yeah. Raymond scored. We saw maybe the three worst shootout attempts in the history of the Detroit Red Wings, and then Suter scored. It was bad. Gerard Gallant <laughs> had uh, Merrick Malik's phone number. He had the first four digits down. Don't tell me. No, yeah. that, that, I love Merrick Malik for that play. The celebration is the greatest thing that's ever happened. In unreal. Hockey. You can't convince me otherwise. <laughs> it's unreal. Goal, goal. Save, save, miss, miss. Save, 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 miss. Goal, Pew Suter. And then a safe. Has anyone ever ridden a hot streak for as long as Adam Ernie has? Like the hot streak ended a year ago, but he's still getting paraded out there as if it was still a functioning thing. I'm not I'm not gonna sit here and get mad at like a single shootout shooter when for the rest of the game <laughs> he's been in every shootout this year. When for the rest of the game I'm actually pretty okay with the decisions, but 
when Adam Ernie went out there, I was like, what? Maybe he's nasty in practice or a- something. That's the only explanation. It has to be. He had that one game against Carolina where he went high blocker in the game and then in the shootout. And like he's been coasting that for a year since. <laughs> it is. It makes absolutely no sense at all. Other than like it has to just be a shootout thing. Or I a, think or other teams practice. do it too, though. Like they I, do. They I, have I've their seen, guys. Yeah, some teams. It's like it's like you've got Sidney Crosby and Malkin and Latang sitting there, and they they're like, no, we're gonna send out Brandon Dumoulin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but you know what happens when other teams do that? Those players generally score because yeah, they, they're actually good at it. <laughs> <laughs> the goalies didn't do their scouting report on Danny DeKaiser's breakaway move. Oh man, if Danny DeKaiser wins in a shootout this year, I will die laughing. There's a bet there somewhere. There, 100% <laughs> is. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, whatever. The shootout decisions, the overtime decisions were what they were, too. Cause that one, like, I don't normally get too uppity about stuff like that, but, you know, we talk about a link, but Philip Zina had one of his best games of the year and didn't play in overtime or get a chance in the shootout. And it's yeah. like, what, what are you? Robbie Fabry was a liability that game and he got a lot of run in overtime. And I think in the shootout, too. So it's just, confusing to me i will say robbie fabry has had a better year so he has a little bit more backing yeah no there. definitely but definitely. you're also very right zadina had a great game and that would have been a good time to put him out there yeah like there's no better way to get a player's confidence up than the shootout like if Especially it's a guy who's crafty right like yeah. he's got the creativity and plus the skills to make yeah. something happen if he goes into the shootout and misses oh, all his confidence is already low who cares if and he goes in and the shootout yeah if he goes in and rips one Okay, now he's feeling it. Like, it, there's no risk. And, it, like, after watching Ernie try and Bertuzzi's weak attempt and Gagne's weak attempt, it's like, okay, like, well, the thing is, is he, it couldn't have been worse. The worst part for him probably is he's like, oh, I had a really good game. And then he watches Adam Ernie. Yeah. Sam Gagne go out. He's like, what the hell do I have to do? Maybe he's maybe he, in practice. Maybe he's terrible. And he's like, or the, or yeah. Lashell's like, Philip, you want to go? And he's like, no. <laughs> In Blashill's defense, Zadina has missed a lot of he, he looks He looks down. Zadina's skates aren't even on. He's like, yeah. all right, you're good. Yeah, I, I mean, like you said, shootout attempt. But I, I was more like in OT would have been a better time. Yeah, because he – like Zadina, you can criticize a lot of what he's done over the last two years. But every time he's went out in OT, he's looked dangerous. Uh-huh. Like that is one of his strengths as a player. When he there's more ice available – He's generally very good at taking it and making stuff happen with it. So uh, Detroit walked away from Madison Square Garden with two points, miraculously. And I say again, Igor Shosturkin is the truth, man. Like that. Yeah, if he doesn't win the business, something's wrong. But Like I, I watched a few Rangers games this year and I knew. But like when you're not a fan of the team, you're not watching as close. So when obviously this game we watched all 60 minutes very intently. Yeah, he's on another planet. Like, even the saves he make that were ridiculous, he didn't make look that hard. No. No. He was so rock solid. Yeah, that... And he got out-dueled. Yeah. Grice was the more impactful goalie that game, which everyone ex- expected. The Red Wing, when you're the worst te- the worser of the teams, <laughs> your goalie generally is more impactful, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so Detroit, after that, had quite a long break. They're not going to play again until Wednesday, uh, February 23rd, 7.30 Eastern against Colorado, and that's at home in Detroit. So that means next podcast is going to be a Thursday podcast for you after that game. Anything else notable about that game? Anything else that we want to chat about? Nope. Fawning over Mark Stahl's two new uh, biggest fans? Nope. That's the Red Wings. Um, before we get into this uh, interview, I first want to tell everyone that this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast is proudly brought to you by the FanDuel Sportsbook, a sponsor that gives hockey fans what we really need, even more excitement. There's so many reasons why FanDuel is America's number one sportsbook, from ease of use uh, in registration deposits and finding your best bet, and withdrawals are quick and easy. FanDuel pays your winnings back in as little as 24 hours. There are always running great odds boosts and specials every day with some big super boosts each weekend. Now listen to this. FanDuel is letting you place your first bet risk-free up to $1,000. Just place a bet on any game and FanDuel will refund you up to $1,000 back if you don't win that bet. No strings attached. If you win, you keep the cash. If you lose, you get that grand back in site credit. What we want you to do is download the FanDuel Sportsbook app to get started with that risk-free bet of up to $1,000 and be sure to sign up with promo code WWP so they know the Winged Wheel podcast sent you. 
That's FanDuel Sportsbook, promo code WWP. You must be 21 and older and present in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, West Virginia, Indiana, Colorado, Iowa, Tennessee, Virginia, or Michigan. First online real money wager only. Site credit is non withdrawable and expires in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See sportsbook.fanduel.com for details. If you have a gambling problem, call 1 800 522 4700 in Colorado, 1 800 bets off in Iowa, 1 800 9 with it in Indiana, 1 800 gambler in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, or Virginia, Tennessee Red Line 1 800 889 979, 1 800 gambler.net in West Virginia, or call 1 800 270 7117 in Michigan. Okay. Uh, now to tune in to our returning interview. Uh, last time we had him on was October of 2018 with Ricard Gronberg, the head coach of the Zurich Lions, uh, former Swedish national team head coach, worked with junior national teams as well. Uh, one of the most distinguished coaches not in the NHL right now. And the general thinking is that that will change one day. He's probably going to be among the first in line, if not the first in line as a European uh, head coach in the NHL. So always a great time uh, chatting with Ricard and really, really excellent coaching insights. Um, we love interviews with him and, and we think you'll like him too, or you'll like this one too. So without further ado, our interview with Ricard Gronberg. It has been a few years uh, since we've had you on the show, but welcome uh, to distinguished coach Ricard Gronberg. Ricard, I am saying your North American name here because I'm not even going to risk brutalizing the actual pronunciation, but welcome back to the Winged Wheel podcast all the way from Zurich in Switzerland. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Can you just, for, for the record, let us know what the actual pronunciation is, which we will never get right? <laughs> you got to roll those R's, uh, Rickard Grönborg. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We we'll, can't do that. We can't we'll, do that. We'll leave that one up to Brad in the future. Um, Ricard, no you're, you're... No. You're with the ZSC Lions right now, but you've had a distinguished coaching career starting with... Um, Actually, I think I remember from last time you started as an assistant coach with St. Cloud State uh, from your time in the state. So why don't you walk us through a little bit, just a quick summary of your coaching career to get to where you are now? Yeah, that's uh, actually uh, the, the year I, I retired from hockey was, uh, was a pretty easy decision for myself. But I, I decided to to go the college route, playing ice hockey, and I, I, I got a scholarship at St. Cloud State. And that's the reason why I came over to the U.S. the first, first time when it was uh, back in '89. Believe it or not, so it's a few years ago, and and then I played a few years after my my college career. I, I played a few years in, in Sweden, and then I decided I want to go back and finish off my my bachelor's degree. And when I get back to campus, uh, the head the head coach there uh, was actually my old head coach who you know, asked me if I wanted to help out, more or less uh, push pucks and, and be a graduate assistant. That's how, really how this this uh, interesting journey started with me coaching. So um, and after that, I've been. Um, I took my master's degree and I was coaching at a smaller school at, uh, at UW Stout in, in, in uh, Wisconsin, right across the border from uh, from Minnesota there, and, uh, and um, you know, coached some juniors, U.S. juniors, Canadian juniors. Uh, got involved with uh, uh, Swedish national team uh, actually 13, 14 years ago. And it's it's been a, um, a long run with the national team for, for many years, uh, where I coached at different levels, everything from. Under 18. Um, as a matter of fact, I started with under 16, moving up to under 18, under 20 in, in the national team. So um, I had a, a, a huge uh, a fun run with, with the national team in Sweden and I worked with the federation for, for that many years. And, and obviously, um, most of the guys in NHL, those are the guys that kept coming out of our program. So I was fortunate enough to, to work with most of those guys. So it's been a it's been a fun journey. And, and uh, when I decided not to continue with the na national team, I um, you know, I, I took this job in, in Zurich, which is, 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 I would say, probably the most attractive job in, in the whole Europe uh, to coach the Setetze Lions here in, in Zurich. And, and uh, it's been a, been a fun journey. And even though, uh, you know, the, the you know, uh, fires and everything hit, and it's been a, been an interesting uh, few years here. But uh, obviously, it's a, it's a beautiful place to live with, with my, my family. But it's also a great tradition of hockey here. And, and the hockey culture is very, very strong in Switzerland. So, it's uh, it's been fun and interesting. So, uh, of interest to Red Wings fans, obviously, Ricard was uh, very humbly putting forward his his coaching experience with the international team. There, uh, I think it was twenty six, twenty seventeen, Double IHF World Championship. You were head coach of the gold medal, medal winning Swedish team, and like you said, you've coached through the ranks, uh, both at you know national teams and junior national teams. So, you will have seen quite a few of the Red Wings prospects and and prominent Swedish and, and European players that have come through. Um, is there anyone 
affiliated with the Red Wings that comes to mind that you've worked with or coached against even uh, that's most notable for you? Well, I, I obviously I, I helped out uh, already in 2010 in Vancouver, the Olympics, and, and, and Lidstrom was still playing then in Zetterberg. And, and um, you know, we had quite a bit of, of uh, Red Wings flair to, to, to that team. Unfortunately, we lost out in the quarterfinals against Slovakia. I'm, I'm a little bit distracted because I'm watching Sweden and Slovakia in the bronze game here. But, um, but uh, and, and later on, I got, a, got an opportunity to, uh, to work with Zetterberg, unfortunately, only for one game in, in the, the Sochi, uh, Sochi uh, Olympics, um, and, and then when I, I took the job as a, as a head coach with the national team, I, I asked Mick Lindstrom if he, if he wanted to help me out and, and be part of the coaching staff and, and management staff, and, and uh, he was uh, uh, obviously helping us out with that. And uh, I learned tremendous uh, a lot from from a player's perspective. I, obviously, some you know best of the best would, would, would I would agree on when it comes to defend. Defenseman, so um, it was interesting to hear from him and, and get his input. So I, I've been uh, been with the um, and, and obviously Hawken Anderson, which is a you know I was uh, favorite scout when it comes to an NHL and, and a lot of the Detroit Red Wing fa- Rings, Rings fans uh, know uh, as, as a, uh, the guru of, of uh, scouting. He's a, he's actually a good personal friend of mine. So uh, I do have a little bit of uh, quite a bit of Detroit Red Wing uh, interest. And and we'll get into that in a few moments here. I think I just want to jump back to one thing you said, which is you've kind of uh, taken a, a, a different step now with this role uh, in Zurich. You've been there for a few years. What was that like in terms of a career move for you? And was this something that you felt you needed to do to uh, better show off your coaching abilities for a, uh, a bigger step in the future? It's just a natural move. I, I don't think you should have the position of being head coach for a national team for that long too long, I should say. Uh, I've seen other coaches have been there for, for six plus years. And, and um, I think just for, for yourself and your own journey, but, but also for the national team, I think it's, it's healthy to to uh, to move on. Um, and uh, I think yeah, there was a time for my in my career too with being part of so many national teams. And I talked about you know, uh, talked about earlier, it's, it's for me to take a step and go back to the daily work of working with one team and and have you know twenty plus players and work with those guys daily and, and have the daily routines of, of two or three games a week and, and, and everything else and prepare the team for that. I think it was just a natural um, you know, move from my part of, of getting back to into that. And uh, um, so far, it's been been, been great. You know, I learned a lot of new hockey culture here in in, uh, in Swiss hockey, and, and uh, you know, there's so many different coaching styles here. You know, you have the North American coaches, you have the Swiss coaches, you have you know the Scandinavian coaches, Finnish, Swedish. Uh, so there's a, there's not a lot of different ways of coaching a team, and I, and it's really helped me out in my coaching career as well, and and made me a better coach. Well, I'm actually glad you brought up all the different coaching styles in um, Europe because that's always one of the things I've been most fascinated by because we always hear the comparisons North American hockey to European hockey. And not very often is it actually explained, uh, other than rink size, what is the difference in the two styles. So as someone you've coached, you know, everywhere on the planet, basically with the national team and, uh, college hockey and, you know, with Zurich and in Sweden, what would you say is the most notable difference in terms of style between the European game and the North American game? Um, when it comes to coaching part of it, to me, is a lot about leadership. And I, I think it's something that, that Swedish people in general are very good at is, is working in group. I mean, we um, I shouldn't say um, we've always been part of a, you know, when I grew up, it was a very socialistic community where everyone needs to chip in. Everyone needs to be part of a bigger, bigger, uh, bigger team. Um, and I think that's, uh, you, you've seen a different team sport. Sweden has always been very, very competitive. Um, not just in hockey, but in other team sports as well. So, um, you know, that part of the leadership, you know, my background is this, um, is being part of something bigger versus when I got a North American, I, I think the more North American style is more of the coaching. Is one guy, is one general, he's, he's he more or less making decisions and he's doing more or less, uh, you know, it's, it's on his shoulders, you know, uh, versus I think in Sweden and in, in, in other country, countries in, in Europe, you, you have a discussion with a team, and the players on the team, they're part of that. And, and you know, some along the lines, the decision needs to be made. And, and, and you know, if, if your head coach, obviously, is going to be on in your, um, you know, you're part of the job as well to make the decision. But I think it's a little bit of a distinction of uh, in Europe. I think we, we ask a lot of questions. I think leadership is part of, 
part of having two ears and one mouth. You listen a lot to people around yourself. It's, it's, it's. I think it's super important to have a tune in when, for example, when I moved to Switzerland to tune in a little bit of, of the Swiss culture because I never coached here before. I, I didn't know the cultural differences. Because there are quite a bit of cultural differences between Swedish hockey and Swiss hockey. So, you know, first thing I did was just brought all the players in one by one and asked questions. Okay, the, the, the tradition of set that say hockey and, and, and you know the tra- tradition of Swiss Swiss hockey. Uh, for me to get a feel for where they're coming from, because if I don't have some kind of a common ground and understanding what they're coming from, and just kicks up and kick up the door and say, okay, this is this is the way we're going to play, this is the way I'm going to coach, and this is who I am, uh, I think it'd be really really tough uh, for for everyone. Versus if you have a, a little bit of a um, so call here finger spitz, like if you like, you have a little bit of feeling of um, you know a little bit of what's going on in the room, a little bit of what other people are coming from. I think you can make better decisions. I think you have a better understanding to make those decisions. So uh, that was really important to me, not just with the players, but everyone around in, in uh, management and, and people, the staff, when it comes to to the team. Um, and, and obviously, I've been down here scouting uh, Swedish player playing in the Swiss league because um, there's a lot of a lot of good players down here that played on my national teams that played on in Switzerland. So I have a little bit of feeling for for the culture here, but. Is really important for me to, to understand. I think that that's that's a big thing for for a Swedish um, Swedish coach and Swedish leadership is is tune in with with other people. And I think you know when it comes to me, be, you know, obviously I'm a U.S. citizen too and lived in the U.S. for so long, and I, you know, I have a, a master's degree in management from U.S. So, so I, I understand also that that the part of somewhere along the line it needs to be a general, it needs to be someone in charge, it needs to be someone who makes the decisions. And I think that's that's has been a strength of mine in my coaching career is I understand the team. I have a, have a long um, understanding of interviewing people and, and, and that way I can make a better and more sound of decision when the decision needs to be made. Uh, but at the same time, I understand also sometimes I need to be a general. I think that's the combination I, that I can bring to the table. Actually, it's super a super interesting answer, and it leads into something I wanted to ask later on, but I feel it kind of ties in now. So here in North America, there was a lot of talk around the coaching ranks after the Montreal Canadiens hired Martin St. Louis, specifically one thing uh, that he said in his presser, which is you don't want to overcoach talent. You want to let your creative players be creative on the ice. I'm obviously shortening the answer there, but that was his essential point. So how much do you agree or disagree with that philosophy and how does that tie in then to exactly what you were just saying in terms of, you know, do you collaborate with your team and your players to, you know, hey, let's try this, let's not try that, let's do this system, let us just run free here, whatever that might be. But um, yeah, I would love to get your insight on, you know, not overcoaching the talent. I think he's, he's right on point. I think he's on something really, really interesting and, and something that I always live by. Um, I, I think I, I had a presentation, I, I think it was probably four years ago with NHL CA, which is a coaching association with NHL, where, you know, they were curious. I had a presentation about Swedish defensemen, why, why Swedish defensemen have been dominating so much as they have in, in, in the world of hockey, and especially in NHL. And I, I think very early, it's a little bit what I said before, we have a discussion with the players. We ask questions to players, uh, how they see from their point of view, and, and we learn from them as well as they gonna learn from us because we're going to help them out with our experience but that we had as a player or, or previous experience as coaches. And I think I think it's right on target when you have to have an understanding for the players. You have to let them make decisions on the ice. However, I think it's also important for us coaches to have the structure, that have something to lean on. A lot of times, I, I kind of divide it up a little bit. Play without the puck and play with the puck. I mean, play without the puck. I think that's a little bit more structure. You need we need to work together. Here, five five man unit or or even six six man unit with with the, with the goaltender. How are we gonna get the puck back versus with the puck? I think we have yeah we have some some structures we go on after. Uh, we have some very creative way I think we, to do an offensive zone and we involve all five players, which is something else I think is in the future. You involve defensemen forwards in, in, in kind of a, a movements where everyone is involved in offense, especially when we have the puck, obviously. So uh, I think he's right on point. We got we have to let the players make decisions on the ice. i give you a, a perfect example. I, I, I've been fortunate enough to coach Victor Hedman. I've, I've been fortunate to coach Eric Carlson. Two very unbelievable, unbelievable defensemen, obviously. 
However, they're way different as players. So, you know, they go in situations in, in, in different games, you know, Victor's going to solve it his way and, and Eric's going to solve it his way because of their skill set. They solve it probably in a different way. But my job as a coach to keep putting them in those situations in practice and also give them the, the background and say, okay, well, you know, if you go down in a corner, you know, you have this, this, this play here, you have another player supporting you there. So I'm setting up the structure, but they need to solve that situation by the skill set. So, you know, as a coach, you have to have that feeling for, for the players. You need to have a feeling for what their strengths are. You need to obviously help them develop more strengths and obviously uh, lessen their, their weaknesses. But at the end of the day, they need to solve those situations. Ricard, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, the Swiss League, um, maybe just an edu- for an educational standpoint for me. Um, do you find that that league has a lot of players playing on the same team for five, ten plus years, or is there a lot of guns for hire guys who come and go? Because um, I've always been interested to know what the other what the other leagues are like. Yeah, you know, again, me. It's a difference from me growing up with and watching the national team of Sweden or, or watching my favorite team in, in Stockholm, where I'm from. Uh, you know, you can have players that played it for 10 plus years or 15 years in the same team, and they're kind of the hometown hero or, or you know, the country's hero because they're playing for so long and everyone knows them, right? So, uh, we, we do have a combination of that. We have some, 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 I would say, stayed here in, in Septet, say, or, or Zurich hockey and have that, that background of Zurich, and it feels a lot for them to, put, to play for the, for the Ambling and everything else. And I think other teams in this league have it as well. Um, and but at the same time, there are some 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 guys that hey, I want to I want to get a different opportunity somewhere else and and, and everything else and, and uh, so it's it's combination of everything and then you need to add on because you know the players make really good money here, especially import players because we only love to have four import players. So um, those players are coming in with a wealth of of, 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 of skills coming in from from NHL or, or former NHL players or, or top of the, you know Swedish league or. or, or other leagues in, in Europe, so so you have the skill set is, is could be a little bit of difference of some teams uh, when it comes to players, uh, and I think you have a little bit of combination where you said uh, you know players that play for the organization and done for a long time, and a little bit of the local heroes and and um, sign a long contract. So it's a combination. Ricardo, I'm going to jump over to the NHL now. Um, I think when we first had you on the podcast in late 2018. It was in uh, October. And the reason I remember that is because I got a speeding ticket on the way to Brad's house to do the interview with you. And I never forget that. It was a great interview, but unfortunately, that was the most notable or the (laughs) part of the day that stuck in my head. But uh, in 2018, you know, your name was really starting to to crop up as the NHL was starting to look a little bit more forward and outside of its regular names for for head coaching jobs. And I feel like there can't be an NHL vacancy at this point, the head coaching position without your name coming up. Uh, just this past summer, it was reported that you had actually interviewed for the vacant Buffalo Sabres uh, head coaching position. And um, in New Jersey, your name was is, was linked pretty heavily as well. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about what it was like to, to interview with Buffalo and uh, your future NHL head coaching prospects as you see it? Yeah, no, no I had discussions. I, I'm you know, trying to keep myself in, in, in tune what's going on in NHL, obviously. Uh, um, you know, where... I did have discussions with those teams when when those jobs were opening up, and, and uh, I think it's important for me to get a feel for for what's out there. But it's also I think for 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 the NHL and NHL teams to get a feel for what's outside the, the NHL, right? Also, um, so um, yeah, I mean it was good good com- communications. I, I think since I didn't play in NHL, I am a coach in NHL. I think it's uh, a lot of a uh, lot of people out there that are making these type of decisions. They they they're interested uh, because obviously. Uh, the scene that success we've had with the Swedish national team, and also we you know, actually we won the league here my first year in, in Zurich. So um, you know we uh, um, you know obviously they they try to look outside the box, and I think that's that's a healthy way of of starting. And then somewhere along the line, you need to have these discussions and and, and talk about uh, you know what's uh, what lays in my future, uh, as well as uh, what the, what what kind of a coach, a kind of coaching profile they want. Um, and by doing that, if they don't know me, they need to have that discussion and. And that's what's happened both in uh, with, the, with the Buffalo Sabres and as well as in the uh, New Jersey Devils. But at the same time, I'm, I'm here in, in Zurich, and I, I really enjoy it. I, I learn something new every day. I, I work with tremendous, uh, a tremendous coaching staff down, staff down here. It's a very competitive league, and, and, uh, 
and everything else. So, uh, you know, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy where I'm at, but at the same time, you know, it's also uh, a tomorrow when, when, when I'm not here in Zurich and where, what's going to happen. Then. What type of uh, preparation goes into interviewing for a coaching position? Not that I'm, I'm looking, but um, I'm just, I'm always curious because that's something, you know, you hear about it and they just say, oh, we've, we're interviewing so-and-so and this person, but you never really hear what kind of questions are they asking? You know, uh, what preparation and what sort of goes into interviewing for a head coaching position? You know, it's all it's all different. I think uh, uh, some some uh, GMs they want to maybe talk a little bit about you and who you are and, and get a feel for what kind of person you are. And uh, you know, obviously, uh, since I've been around the hockey world for for a long time, I'm sure we have some some kind of a, a um, you know common denominator. If it's someone we we play with or, or, or I coach that they know or, or something like that. So, um, you know, just to get a feel for who I am as, as a person into some other, some other, uh, GMs want to get straight into the playbook and, and a little bit what, you know, what I think about different situations or what the difference between coaching in Europe and big ice and the small ice and all that stuff. Uh, it, it all, it's, it's very, uh, um, uh, I think different. I, I think the biggest thing though, for, for myself, I, I think the questions that, I, that I'm really intrigued about because, when you get to a certain level in, in the coaching world, I think the X and O's and coaches know that. Right? They know how to to, to coach that and, and, and get it to the players. But I th- I'm more curious about the leadership. The leadership is, is the biggest thing for me, and I've done a lot of reading, obviously. Uh, that's the reason why I have the masters I have in, in, in leadership and, and management is because I'm curious about that part of it. And, and um, when you're fortunate enough to, to coach, uh, you know, when it comes to, to really uh, – Dire situations with a national team, you know, you know, one guy, one game, and either you're you're a champion or you're not, and, and all that stuff that has uh, is really intriguing to me. How can you get a team of, of different individuals in, into, um, you know, be successful? Uh, and, and the national team situation is over a very short period of time, but but also over a longer period of time when it comes to uh, to a, to a team in a, in, a, in a regular season. So um, that's really intriguing to me. That's where I really get going when, when the GMs are asking about the leadership situations. One thing that I've, uh, was curious about when reading a bunch of the rumors that were surrounding your name in North America was, um, kind of your mindset. Cause obviously you've been a head coach and exclusively a head coach now for about six or seven years. Um, but what would your thoughts be if, a, if a, current NHL coach um, approached you to come onto his staff as an assistant coach in the NHL right now. Is that something that's on your mind or is it head coach or bust? No, I've had those discussions too. Uh, I think uh, even before I took this job down in Zurich, there was a, there was a situation in NHL, with the NHL team was really, really close actually to, uh, to do something like that. I, I think the biggest thing for me is that me and the, if that's the case of a head coach, we see, we see not maybe not just hockey uh, similar way, but also how you, how you treat the players, how you talk to the players, how you communicate with the players, um, how uh, you know similar views when it comes to to leadership. Um, those are all important issues for me, um, and, and, and to me, that's that's more intriguing than anything else. It's no not you know being head coach or a bust for for me. It's it's more of being part of something that's that's. Uh, and that's something you can um, bring something to the table and, and maybe challenge uh, the head coach a little bit too. So uh, it's, it's been, uh, been situations that I've been sincerely interested in. And, and um, you know, obviously, uh, again, I'm, I'm in a position right now with Zurich here. And that, uh, that's uh, obviously I'm on the contract right now, but I've been in discussion before, before I took this job. And I'm sorry to stay on the same vein here, um, but just one last question, at least for me. Uh, about the NHL. And I'm going to use the Red Wings as a very easy example here. Uh, the NHL is moving more and more, I think, towards a path where you see guys coming over from Europe and their skill set and their abilities translate to the NHL game a little bit quicker. I think the NHL game has gotten faster and more skilled, so there's not such a stark difference. Um, Lucas Raymond has come in and, and done what he's done in Detroit, and, and Moritz Sider has taken the league by storm. Do you think players like Raymond and Sider – having a bigger part of, you know, winning teams. And I say that lightly with Detroit lends well to your time coaching over in Europe, um, possibly being a better fit now than it would have been, you know, 10, 12, 15 years ago. 
yeah, I, I, I don't know if I can speak for, for 12 or 15 years ago, but I think the world is obviously getting smaller and smaller. Uh, and what I mean by that is, is the information flow. It's obviously a nanosecond here, and, and you have, you know, the skill set, what happened in NHL last last night versus when I went to hockey school myself was a Super 8 film of 1980 uh, NHL playoffs with the New York Islanders winning the, the Cup. So it's, um, and that was uh, probably five, six years later. So it, it the, the information flow and, and, and you know, I think uh, uh, when it comes to all kinds of, of different things in the, in the hockey world, it's so quick and everyone's picking up on everything. Plus, you have the international cups. Uh, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be a be head coach in the World Cup. I mean, that was one of my biggest experiences I ever ever had. Um, you know, where, where the best of the best are playing against each other. Also in Sochi, you know, the best of the best are playing. And, and obviously, us losing the, the, the mighty Canadians there in the finals. I mean, so, you know, only by myself being in those type of situations, uh, obviously uh, you learn uh, you learn a lot. And and uh, you know, with my my background, I, I think that's what was one of the things that the, the federation in Sweden was so uh, curious about myself. Of, of I'm coming from a, a very solid you know hockey background from Sweden, moving over to North America, and, and and before I took these jobs with the national team, I've only been coaching in North America. So um, I think that the combination of that. Uh, was, was something that they really wanted to uh, to to explore, and, and and also for me to help the coaches over in, in Sweden when, when it comes to coaches development program, which was a, a big thing for, for for Swedish hockey of of uh, investing in is is, uh, um, is is bringing over some some influences from other countries, and, and obviously uh, you know I was part of, of uh, I wrote quite a bit for the federation, I did a lot of videos for the federation, especially when it comes to leadership and, and, and coaching, uh, and, and especially then on bench coaching. Back then, so I, I think uh, in a long way, window way of, of answering your question, I think the hockey world is so small right now. You know, everyone knows everyone, and and every tendencies are being picked up. And and I think also when it comes to players, I mean, you, you know, you're walking around with the cell phones and they get all the clicks and everything else. What happened in the NHL last, last night from from our players, and I, I'm sure uh, there's some some other uh, other leagues as well. So uh, the tendencies are, are and the secrets are not you know that secret anymore. And uh, I, I actually lied to you. I apologize. Um, one more question that's come up. Nicholas Litstrom has obviously taken a, a more concerted role back with the Detroit Red Wings within the executive leadership uh, position. And he had a really interesting uh, interview with SVT Sport uh, where he actually mentioned your name. You know, he was talking about people he had contact with. And he said, uh, uh, you know, he's kind of stayed in touch with you. Um, Ricard and I met uh, Eisman in Tampa uh, just as a, a paraphrase, uh, is Lidstrom someone who you've uh, kind of stayed in touch with through your coaching career? And is there anything more you can comment on that? No, Nick and I are friends. I mean, at the end of the day, I, I didn't really know him until um, uh, until we started working together for the for the World Cup. Um, and uh, you know, by working with him and next to him, uh, just to get his point of view of different special decisions when it comes to players, but also the way we wanted to play. Uh, it was a huge learning curve for me and, and just being around him and for that long we were traveling quite a bit uh, together and, and that period of time we got to know each other as well um, so uh, you know obviously I, I he's a guy that I'm definitely uh, bouncing ideas off I, I continuously uh, contacted him especially when I got the job down here I you know he watched some some game tapes he gave some feedback to two different things and, and what he, he saw he came down visit me once down here um, so he's a guy that uh, I've used um, in many situations of bouncing ideas off, especially. And, and obviously I, I, I like him as a person. He's a, he's a, he's a very sharing person. He's always been very inviting to, to whatever he's, uh, he's been involved in. So uh, a person I, I look up to and, and a guy I really appreciate for, uh, not just for, for hockey, but uh, life in general as well. Well, moving from the NHL to the next biggest league, uh, you're telling us off air that after this, you have to take your daughter to her hockey game. Um, I'm just wondering where you sit on the hockey dad scale, and since you, you of your coaching pedigree, uh, how involved do you get in that? Are you the the dad that just kind of hands off, let them do it, or are you sending the uh, the game tape to the coach in an email afterwards? You know, perfectly honest, I'm very standoffish. I I uh, I watch in practice. I I'm trying to be obviously very supportive of my daughter. Um, she's uh, She's interested, but she's not a diehard hockey fan. She comes to our games and everything else, like my, my younger daughter as well. Uh, 
she likes it. She's a really good skater. I, I taught her how to skate, and that's the big thing for me to, to teach my daughters how to skate. Uh, but, uh, you know, playing hockey was – she started hockey – because she, she had a couple of neighbors in Sweden when, when uh, a few years ago this, this started play hockey and, and she wanted to do it as well. So um, I'm trying to take her everywhere. I try to watch as much as I can, and I'm, I'm very stay offish even when the coaches uh, on their teams are approaching me about different things. I'm, I'm very very general with things because I think just let them have the, the journey. Let's have their their fun and, and uh, whatever that takes them. That's that's fine with me. All right, folks, uh, Ricard actually has to take his daughter to a game today, so we're going to let him go. Ricard, thank you so much for jumping back on the show. Um, we shouldn't wait three and a half years to invite you back. Ricard Gronberg, everyone, uh, head coach of the Zurich Lions, and a name I'm sure you're going to be hearing plenty more. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys. Really, really appreciate it. That was our interview with Ricard Gronberg, a very interesting one. We uh, There's quite a bit there, eh? He, he's an, he's an intensely professional guy, and so he was never going to say more, you know, than than what he should. But he did a great job of saying exactly as much as he could. I do wonder. Ricard Gronberg is going to be in the NHL someday, and and I think you asked the right question there, Brad. Like I, I think just with the way the NHL is, the path has to be as an assistant coach first. And and Ricard actually had a really interesting answer to that, um, and it was a very honest and real one, and it kind of gave you an insight into even a, a coach as distinguished as him if you're not you know in the in circle you have to find your way in and is it's you know poignant but um he'll make it in and that's not the question are the red wings the link here you know he's close with uh hulk and anderson he's close with nicholas lidstrom who very recently has you know name drop name dropped a card seemingly of his own accord there's a lot of speculation there and, and this is no different like this is of course speculation based on no one has made said anything concretely or anything like that but you just kind of think like it all fits it all fits lidstrom knows him and lidstrom has a you know part of his role is just advising the general manager and advising the coaching staff overall they brought nick on for a very specific reason and that's to take his word for things Hawkin anderson is you know, as legendary as you can be in the NHL without being a player, a coach, or a general manager. And look at the Swedish contingent on Detroit. The puzzle is there. I don't want to say it's guaranteed because you actually made a good point before the interview. Another team might swoop in. Buffalo and New Jersey have already considered it. So, Yeah, and... We've had no indications that there's going to be any coaching change in Detroit anytime no. soon. So as much as we all would personally love Ricard to come and be a part of the Red Wings, if there's not an opening there, Hard. it can't happen. Um, yeah, so he, he's, I think, got one year left on his contract in Zurich. So he'll probably be over after that, if not before. Don't know if how that works. How, that contract works if there's an out clause or if no, he's, he, so, yeah. he's there for another year. But yeah, no, it was, I, I love interviews with just really smart hockey people like that, because even his answer on the differences between North America, and he didn't even bother getting into gameplay. And his answer was so much more interesting. Yeah. In terms of leadership and collaboration and, and how, like basically talking about how the NHL, and North America has more of like that authoritarian style coaching. Like, this is my team. This is my ship. You're going to do it. And like, not that there's anything particularly wrong with that. It does work for a lot of coaches, but it doesn't work for everybody. Whereas in, in Europe, that's not really the case all too often. And that, that was a bit of, so we refreshing to hear. Mm -hmm. He's got a really yeah. unique perspective on the game. Yeah. And for a guy who's had to coach so many different teams with so many different shapes to them, right? Like, you kind of need that. You can't just go in there and ham fist your one style into every situation. And that's what, that's part of the unique European experience. Like, Well, tell that to Mike Babcock. <laughs> well, Mike Babcock. Well, He walks in the room. He's like, I'm going to bully you and you. <laughs> in fairness, Mike Babcock only coached one kind of team. Like he just made it into his team wherever he went. And, you know, the, the places he was coaching, that's what they were expecting. It wasn't groupthink. No. No, God, no. Unless that group was just a one-man group. 
<laughs> yes. It was... Uh, I want to know what all of you think. All right, we're done here. <laughs> I'll start. All right. <laughs> yeah. That's a good place to wrap up. <laughs> it was Mike Babcock's world. Absolutely. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I I, th- I think it's only a matter of time. Like you said, I hope it's Detroit. I think it's a really... He can bring a really good set of fresh eyes, but also... You know, we can have this speculation. We can talk about, you know, if there's smoke, there's fire, or here's how well it fits. There isn't any indication of coaching change. Not as we know of right now. Not to say it couldn't happen in the future, but it's not something where by any means we're saying, oh, yeah, this is imminent. And not every team is a good fit for a communal, you know, problem solving, right? Like, Mm -hmm. It's not always a good fit. Like, It's not saying that's his only thing he can do, right? Like, I'm sure he... Sounds like he could he can adapt to any sort of coaching style and any team and personnel situation that gets thrown his way, but not every team has that uh, or is a good fit for that thought process or coaching style. Um, but but I think it's a, it's a refreshing way the NHL could go. Scares the shit out of other teams' coaches. That's a thing that he does. Yeah, you ever seen that clip with uh, during the brawl where the coat like the the benches were yapping at each other? He got the wide eyes. I was like, oh, my God, that is the scariest man on ice right now. And he's standing behind the bench in a suit. And then walks into the room. All right, gentlemen, what should we do for the third period? <laughs> Mark's all in the corner. Can send it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. The NHL has taken to making some trades recently, which is interesting. It's finally happening. So why don't we start with uh, – let's do the Calgary Flames Montreal Canadiens. So Tyler Toffoli was – due to be one of the big names of the trade deadline. Um, and they got that out of the way quick, quick, which is both good and bad. It makes trade deadline date a little bit more boring, but good because then you don't have to hear about Tyler Toffoli then being traded for Connor McDavid by the end of it with how hyped up it is. So the Calgary Flames swooped in. They got Tyler Toffoli. And in exchange, the uh, Habs get Tyler Pitlick, Emil Heineman prospect, a top 10 protected 2022 first round pick, so if the pick is in the top 10, then Calgary has the option to instead send their 2023 first, which if they do, they also have to send a 2024 fourth round pick. And Montreal also gets a 2023 fifth round pick in the trade. And, you know, Toffoli has a contract, a $4.25 million a year contract. So pretty reasonable for the kind of guy he is. Yeah, for a few more years. Like yeah. That. Not a rental. Yeah, this is so... This kind of caught me off guard coupled with, I think uh, it was Corey Pronman did an like, hypothetical trade article on The Athletic where he asked a bunch of NHL execs about would this get a deal done? This team says no, that team says no. And basically what Calgary got or gave up for Toffoli was about what every other team is asking for a rental. Except they got a cost-controlled proven score for multiple years. So I, I like, obviously this makes sense for Montreal because they're a team that desperately needs to get into a rebuild and Heinemann's an okay prospect who probably projects as a bottom six, maybe a middle six forward. You know, the first round pick is always nice, but that's probably going to be in the twenties. Um, and then the other pieces are mostly inconsequential. Um, and Calgary's walking away with a, like a top six scoring winger for multiple years. Under five mil a year. Like, if I'm a Calgary fan, I'm over the moon right now. I don't think it was bad for other teams. I think Calgary definitely made, I think that was a very shrewd move by them to pick him up for the pieces that they dealt and what they were, they managed to keep on their team and to get someone cost controlled. I think that was really, really well done by them. But I don't think Montreal lost here. I think, I think it was, you know, they got their first, they got a decent prospect. They got the buffet of return. Yeah. A lot of like they they got something solid like a really good piece something that is at least pretty good and then a couple you know darts to throw at the board. It was they didn't give Toffoli away for nothing, which is important, especially if you're going to trade him this early in the game when you could have run the price up. That's what I'm curious about because you know every year every player on the market, oh this guy's going to get a first and a top tier prospect, and then he gets traded for like a conditional second round pick. Like yeah. every deadline it happens, but this year there seems to be more big names on the market than usual. So I'm curious to see at the end of the day, how this trade shakes out relative to the rest of the market, 
just because Montreal was aggressive in getting this out of the way early, um, which means this was what their ask was and Calgary just met it. Because you're not moving a guy early unless it goes, we want this, this, and this, and the other team goes, okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, like if, if Claude Giroux gets a similar return, obviously he's a better player than Toffoli, but he's a rental. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really curious to see how the rest of this market shakes out and how this trade looks in two months. Montreal, that rebuild is starting in a very real way. Just in time, too. <laughs> Although, you know, I can rip on them all I want. They got a cup run. You know, they had their party. You know what they didn't get in that cup run, though? A cup. A cup. Anyways, every opportunity to dump on Montreal, I will take it. Uh, and then last night, the Leafs uh, acquired Ryan Dezingle and Ilya Lebushkin and dealt away Nick Ritchie in a 2025 conditional second which Arizona could instead choose to switch to a 2023 third. I hate hockey trades so much. Um, <laughs> this pulls Toronto away from a lot of like the Ben Chirot rumors and things like that. Uh, Labushkin's not an offensive defenseman. He's purely just to play defense. Like, yes. A solid shutdown defender. Um, they got rid of Nick Ritchie and, you know, Delta pick that's either not this draft, but next or in 2025. So, you know, again, Arizona retooling. They're just adding as many premium picks as they can, making value of the guys that they have that won't be there for when they plan on being competitive. You know, what comes first, Arizona being competitive again, or they have a new arena? Neither. <laughs> Quite honestly, maybe that's probably the most likely answer. Yeah, that 2025 second round pick, is that going to be made by Houston? or <laughs> A 2025 pick. You almost shouldn't be allowed to trade that far out. You should. You should. But it's just like, a, yeah, all right. 22. They're going to find I, that under their couch in 2024. I go, oh, I forgot we had this. May I introduce you to the world of OHL trades? Yeah. OHL there were 2027 20, picks swapped <laughs> this year. OHL <laughs> trades are like, hey, we traded this team dentist for the four leading scorers in the league, our first round picks for the next 20 years, and 100 jerseys. <laughs> we won the trade somehow. <laughs> it's a really good dentist. Uh, yeah, so that that's the Leafs who are looking like um, the age old tradition NHL tradition of trading second round picks for depth defensemen. The Le- Dezingle's not nothing. But. No, no, he's not. But uh, the Leafs and wanting someone to just play defense, please just play defense, is one of the oldest stories in the NHL, and it's really fun to to watch it play out. I'm gonna say this because it might be a jinx, and but also because it's real. Leafs look good this year, man. Yeah, you know it's going to be sweet when they have to play Florida and then Tampa. <laughs> oh wow, yeah, they are at uh they're in Florida or they're in Tampa Bay range right now actually. I mean, you probably want the hardest path possible because if you don't, you play Montreal and they go to the Stanley Cup finals. <laughs> um but yeah, until the Leafs win a playoff series, they're a non-factor to me. Like do the Leafs tank the last two weeks of the season so Boston will pass them so Toronto can get a wild card spot and play first in the Metro? Like I feel like that's a better option. Leafs against Carolina, though. I don't or, know what their order Tampa. I, I don't know. I'd rather. I don't know what their head to heads are, but seeing Freddie Anderson beat the Leafs would be just the cherry on top. Just absolutely unstoppable, not letting a single shot in. That'd be incredible. Yeah, I am so excited for playoff hockey. I'm so excited for playoff hockey when the Wings are in it. Yeah, I, I too cannot wait for that for the first time in it's seven, a hot seven years. It <laughs> is a hot take, believe it or not. We are interested in watching the Red Wings play in the playoffs. Uh, the trades are starting to ramp up. I hope we see more of it. I'm very excited for trade deadline day, though. Dan. It's still like five weeks from now, which is horrifying to think about. Uh, a month and a day. Pretty so close four, to five. Almost just over four, four weeks. Four and a half weeks. Idiot Brad. He thought it was five weeks. 4.42 weeks. This is stupid idiot Brad. If you round that, that rounds to four. Remember your significant digits. Jeez. You're a significant digit. It's, I don't know. I, I had nothing there. I thought I would <laughs> find trying. it on my way. I'm not even, man. I'm not giving you guys 100% right now. I'm sorry. Look at my posture. That's, yeah, you have a nice gamer hump yeah. right now. <laughs> I'm, sitting like, I'm sitting like a milk bag. What did you say? There was actually something that's like it was in the middle of um, we had a, a small pause to edit something. <laughs> we were talking about Evan sniffling and, <laughs> and Brad goes, the milk is trying to escape the bag. 
<laughs> yeah. I didn't hear that, but that is very true. <laughs> you could, you couldn't hear it. Everything was in your sinuses. So the uh the Olympics. Team Finland, gold medal winners. And Valtteri Filpula, gold medal winner. Hell yeah. As we all expected. I love the the storylines. Like the storylines coming out of the women's game is like this incredible gold medal game between the states and Canada and just like some of the best athletes in women's hockey of all time playing historic moments, et cetera, et cetera. And out of the men's side, it's like, Hey, Valtteri Filpula and uh, Franz Nielsen are playing. <laughs> <laughs> That's about what we got there. Uh, but it was, it was funny. Ricard was actually watching Sweden and Slovakia bronze medal game as he was interviewing with us. Shout out to all the guests who come on this podcast. They always have like much better things to be doing. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I've got to take my daughter to her hockey game. I was like, "Oh, sorry." <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're complete, like we're not we're not important at all. And he's like, "Oh no!" And he's watching the you know the former coach of the uh, the national team was watching the national team play in the Olympics while talking to a few bums on a Red Wings podcast. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Slavkovsky took home took home bronze as Slavkovsky two more goals. He was tournament MVP too. Oh wow! As a seventeen-year-old, yeah, you think he, he's going top five? I think yeah, he's going top five. He's not falling to Detroit's range. No, no chance. Unless, Detroit could drop fourth, then I don't think he's there. Detroit could fall to his range. That's about well. That's more likely, but not if they keep playing like they do at Madison Square Garden. Yeah, that's not fair. Happening. That's fair. That's what I thought after this game. I was like, "There's no, um, there's no catastrophic fall this year. Like that's not happening." Detroit, at worst, I think can set themselves up with like the eighth best odds before uh, sixth. Yeah. Something like that. It's like going home. <laughs> <laughs> I want it at this point. Look what it's turned into. But yeah, the uh, Finland beat the um, the team that's definitely not Russia. <clears throat> <laughs> this these aren't Russians, but it's a team from Russia with Russian players. But this isn't Russia who took home silver. I read a stat that said Finland hadn't given up an even strength goal since the first game. Whoa. After that, it was either penalty kill or spe- it was a special teams goal that they gave up. It is cool. It is cool to see, like, it's a unique kind of competition that comes about when you remove, obviously, we, we made our complaints last episode, like, when you remove the best on best parameters of it, the NHL players aren't there, whatever. There still is, like, a unique way of the competition progressing with, like, the, the guys emerging from uh, from those countries that otherwise would have never had the chance. So it's fun to see. Congratulations, Finland, Valtteri, Philip, a gold medal winner. Now for the real highlight of the Olympics. Team Canada versus Team USA, one of the most storied battles in the history of hockey, the sport, for the gold medal. The gold medal game between Canada and the U.S. was on at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and it was the most watched hockey game since 2019 in terms of ratings. It's one of the only hockey games since 2019. Fair. No, but seriously, that, like that was – there's no way I was missing that. We had recorded an episode – where I had messed up three trillion times, spent hours editing, and I was exhausted and I turned the game on. I was like, there's no way I'm missing this. Yeah, and it was a good game. It wasn't the didn't follow the traditional US Canada script where it's close the whole way through. This one was Canada went up, US came back, but fell just short. But uh yeah, that game winning goal goes to Marie Philippe Poulin on an absolute I don't think people appreciate how hard that goal is the rebound comes out to her at a billion miles an hour she catches it with her skate in one motion shoots it from a bad angle and banks it right off the skate in it it was almost too fast to see it was it's crazy like it was the goal was so good and she played so well that an ECHL team offered her a contract yeah crazy I um I do think that game would have been I mean hot take here if if the Americans played better it would have been better but um, they were really let down by goaltending especially early on yeah, Poulin's first goal wasn't great. That should be stopped a hundred out of a hundred times. And you know, can't not point out that Brandon Decker wasn't playing for the States after. Yeah. That's a huge blow for the Americans throughout the whole tournament. Seeing her behind the glass, you're like, that hurts. Like that's painful. Yeah, and then she had the little scooter out for the medal ceremony and you just it crushes. Scooter you. gang. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everyone walk, comes out on one. Yeah, because it was a bit of a like Canada won both games in this tournament against the against the States, but it really was a script flip for the second one because the u.s dominated the round robin game and the u.s got goalied yeah um then canada was a better team in the gold medal game but they actually won um mainly because marie philippe Poulin is probably the most clutch hockey player in the history of hockey four gold medal games seven goals the three 
games that Canada won the gold medal, she had the game winner in all of them. That just one would be enough for, you know, my grandkids' grandkids are going to be telling this story. Yeah. She has three of them. She has three. In Vancouver, uh, was this final score 2 nothing? Marie Philippe Poulin, two goals. In 2014, one goal in regulation to tie it with under a minute left. OT winner to follow. Then in 2018, Canada loses to the States, but she still scores a goal in regulation. And then now 2022, three, two win, two goals, including the game winner. It's f-ing absurd. There's no player in the history of hockey who has had a run like that. Four gold medal games in a row where she's the star. Like, that's a 12-year stretch. Yeah, that's an insane amount of time. She's out of her pro- – like, not you're not talking like, oh, you're in your prime that whole time. Like, that is a long amount of time. She's doing it at 18. Now she's doing it at 30. No problem. She'll do it again. Oh, yeah. she'll. Be, she's not done. That's no. the scary part. Yeah. I – you know, watching that gold medal game, all I can think of was PWHPA, PHF. I don't care who does it. Please put a pro team in Detroit. And all the and that gold medal game silenced the whole. Oh yeah, but will people watch it? No, it was the most watched fucking hockey game since 2019. People will watch. You put good hockey on the ice, people will watch it. Oh, is it as good as the NHL? Probably not. Who cares? It's still good. Like, please, Batman, just do something. I uh, you can't count on the NHL. No, you absolutely cannot. They, they were can't. going, but no, okay, they were going to, but then all of their money went away. <laughs> I don't know if they were ever going to. I think they were very close. I think they were very close. They were active in discussions. The money was there on the table. Well, if the league he- has made more money this year than they did before COVID. Do they actually? I think their revenues are are up significantly. And yeah. Now they're putting um, ads on jerseys. They've had full buildings all year except for like a month and a half window in – the seven Canadian markets, which make up a ton. It's a ton, but it's not like this is a no revenue season. But if you're a league that wants to make money, I don't know, maybe make another league to make you some money. <laughs> I think I heard every Leaf game that didn't have fans cost the team three point five million dollars. Oh yeah, I'd be surprised is, if it was just that much. That is well, crazy. Twenty rough math, twenty thousand seat arena, lowest ticket price is over a hundred dollars. It's a lot of coin. <laughs> Yeah, it's. I, I honestly would be shocked if it was just that. Yeah, I know there aren't as many Canadian teams. I don't know if that's profit or just like. No, it's just revenue, straight cash. up revenue. But it doesn't matter either way, honestly. Yeah. So yeah, congrats to Team Canada on taking home gold. Uh, congrats to Team Finland on taking home gold. I hope we have NHL players in four years, but hey, uh, some version of World Championship will be coming back. So. The World Cup. World Cup, sorry. Uh, they need, we need uh, I'm sure this will be exactly what the fans want and exactly the remedy for no Olympic hockey. Let's go Team Young of North America. Yeah. Stu- like we've said team before. Team TikTok against Team... <laughs> Snapchat. N- yeah, Team Snapchat. Dude Perfect is actually just going to be a team. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> here just- comes our... Instead of TV timeouts, we've got 15-second weird dances. Done by Evan. Absolutely not. Evan mean, just pops up on national TV doing the renegade. Yeah. <laughs> Evan, best friends with Jackson Mahomes. All right. Uh, why don't we jump into overtime in this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. Uh, overtime is brought to you by our Patreon supporters who are wonderful people and uh, allow us to do things like talk to the former head coach of the Swedish national team and also um, do this podcast at an unholy hour in the morning. Uh, we'll start with Ryan Hubbard, who says, uh, happy to be back, guys. If you had to choose a Red Wings midseason MVP, who would you pick? Also, uh, how much difference in reality has Tange made on the power play? Love all the content. Keep it up. Um, second part first. Not as much as I would have hoped. Not as much as I would have liked after seeing it for the first month. But it's better than it was last year. Um, and for the first part of the question... As fun as it would be to pick Mo Sider, it's Dylan Larkin. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Although it is insanely close, I'd say. Yeah, it's close, but it's it's Larkin. Lark, if, if Larkin was having a Bertuzzi-level year and Bertuzzi is having a phenomenal year, like fantastic year, Bertuzzi is having one of the best years of his already good career, it would be Sider. But Larkin is just at a different gear right now. 
which leads into the next question from Matt T says, but really is Larkin a legit, at least better than average first line center. Now number six uh, in, or six in center points in that Selkie play. Will he keep it up for the next few seasons? Yeah. So if we're looking at this season in a bubble, he is absolutely top half of the league. Number one center. Um, the only argument against him is that he's been pretty inconsistent year to year over his career. So if you're looking at the grand picture, it's still up for debate. I'd lean yes, just obviously because of recency bias. Um, but yeah, no, if, if we're just isolating this year, yeah, no question. Kyle Karagitz says, as they are right now, rate Shane Wright and Connor Bedard in terms of uh, Chell, <laughs> franchise, generational player, whatever it might be. Bedard then, right? I think he he wants a rating. I I will not give guys a generational rating unless it's like so obvious, like McDavid. I don't know what the Chell ratings are. Connor Bedard. What's what's McDavid for reference? Generational. Generational. What are the tiers below that? I don't know. Franchise. Franchise and I wouldn't. I don't even know if Shane Wright's really a f- franchise. I'd right say now? Connor Bedard franchise. Shane Wright whatever is franchise below. whatever below that bubble. Yeah. All star bubble. There you go. Shane Wright. Uh, Josh Phillips says, not long ago, you guys said the defense owed Ned an offensive line's worth of Rolex watches for what they put him through. My question is, do you guys have any good, my goalie is mad at us because because of our play stories? It reflects poorly on me, so you guys will love it. So, um, we're down by one minute, under a minute left. Oh, sorry, we're up by one, under a minute left, face off in our zone. I win it back, scramble, I go in for support, get it, fire it down the ice, miss the net icing. Comes, win the face off again, get it, get control of the puck, get to the, like, our blue line, fire it, hit the post, other team comes back and ties it. So I missed two empty nets, tie it. When I tell you, you could have been in the parking lot and ho- heard our goalie feeding it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I might be actually under exaggerating that. So yeah, that's uh that's my favorite one. I used to like to rush to rush the puck up the ice as a defenseman. And um you know, it's fun to do. But the worst thing is when you don't actually make it through the neutral zone, but you have that full head of speed, so the puck stops but you keep going. <laughs> yeah, that was bad. I have more than a few of those for sure. I can't think of any. No, you're flawless. Oh, yeah, huh? 100%. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is a funny one. Tyler C says, you guys mentioned that they'll need to make doors uh, extra tall at the LCA. They actually actually already did this for the Pistons. You can see the oh, extra yeah. height they added to each door. That's really funny. <laughs> I would not even have thought of that. This is the hockey door. This is yeah. the, the basketball door. Well, it's the hockey door now. Edmondson, Cider, Kosa when he gets. Yeah. No kidding. Um, I have to read this because Elmer Soderbloom had a, an, Oh yeah. We didn't even talk about the uh, racketeering smoker, the racketeering smoker. That's right. Uh, large, the prophet of the towering behemoth, um, says as the prophet of the towering behemoth, Elmer Soderbloom, it's my holy duty to ask, have you finally seen the light? Yeah. That dude's making the NHL. I think we said that like a year ago where we're like, yeah, he's better than not more likely than not to make the NHL. And yeah. then this season's basically cemented it because he's leading for London goals. Is he not? Uh, he's up there. Or he's leading. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, Lars says, let's draft Slavkovsky, trade for Tage Thompson, and play them with Lord Elmer. <laughs> now for a quiz. Who is the first Swede to ever play with the Red Wings? If you guys get this, I'll be astonished. Boreas Alman. Oh, that was my guess. Tommy Bergman in 72-72. Ah, yes, of course. Zero yeah. chance I was getting that. Uh, and... Red Wings super fan Randy says I've been spe- spending time looking through left-handed D free agents and the group is pretty underwhelming. However, however, do any of these sound like good fits to for the Wings to go after this summer? Nikita Zadorov, no, not for the money he'd demand. Will Butcher, no. Ole Mata, no. Ian Cole, yes, actually. Alex Edler, how Maybe. old is Alex Edler? Like forty-six. Yeah, I wouldn't hate Cole or Edler. Yeah. Ryan Murray. Maybe, yeah, actually. Keith Yandel. No. 
Brendan Smith. <laughs> Don't. Yes. <laughs> yes, so, because that's his Sign that yesterday. 100%. Uh, okay. Why don't we take one more here? Babe Landeskog. I know it's a little early to ask, but who do you think will be on the cover of the next NHL video game? And who do you want to be on the cover? Isn't, don't they just only do Austin Matthews now? <laughs> wow. Hey guys, whether you like it or not, it's going to be Trevor Zegers on that cover. <laughs> oh yeah. And who do I want on that cover? I want Dylan Larkin. He deserves it. But I'll- not Dylan Larkin. I want like Dylan Larkin in his basement. D plus. There, there's one acceptable answer for what face needs to be the face of the NHL. Gritty. Close. Mark Stahl. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> that'll, be the, that'll be the regional version. Yeah, absolutely. The region, Earth. Nobody deserves to be free from Mark Stahl. <laughs> Mark Stahl runs all. Um, okay. Uh, we have some OT questions from uh, Reddit. Uh, how did you guys like the newest edition of the Ice Hockey Gift Cider video? Um, I love all of them. There's a new one? Yep. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Is it's... there more bad takes? No, I mean, I, I think all of our takes got squeezed into the first one. Oh, good. This one is more of like Cider now, like what he's done this year, and it's good. longer. It's I mean, it's great content. Everyone should go watch. Uh, and then the funny second half of this question, I just needed to read it out. This is from Fat JC. says, uh, also, what do you think about Ricard Gronberg and the rumor that he could join the Wings coaching staff? Good timing. Relevant timing. Murdoch Hockey says, who do you think will be the first prospect who makes the NHL but never plays for the Red Wings because they have been traded away when Eisman is buying at the deadline? Who did? Who will make the NHL in five years? Yeah, I don't think they've been drafted yet. <laughs> yeah, of who the Detroit Red Wings have right now? They're still entering high school. I don't know. Maybe you can think of a scenario where Johansson plays in Grand Rapids next year and is traded before making Detroit. Probably someone who's a longer project, but maybe Tuomisto? Yeah. Right-handed D, already a logjam, like is more a long-term project. Wallander, maybe? Just because his... He's up there. It, it's going to be a defenseman because they don't have enough forwards to trade one. Yeah, Tuomis was actually – or Wallander is actually a really uh, good point there. Uh, okay, we're going to wrap up. We want to thank everyone for listening to these uh, these episodes of the Winged Wheel podcast and uh, Ricard Gronberg for coming on the show. We also want to thank our sponsors, FanDuel Sportsbook, and, of course, our name-level supporters on Patreon. Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Gron Foundation, Kyle Karagitz, Nick Perks, Brett Bailey, Terry Driver of the number 69, Cry and Ryan Hennis, Benina Simon Jamathong, Taylor Tadgel, Matthew M. Rice, B. Diz, Boos, Lobsinger, Carl Bruton and Analuski, Chimmy, Citizen High Five, CJ Sully, Craig Kibble, Daniel Garcia, who I believe is a new name level sponsor. Welcome, Daniel, and thank you for joining the Dub Dub Club. Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, Give Blood, Fight Probert, Grape Flavored Lubrication, Greech, Hana Lee, Hassam al Qasem, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, uh, Justin and the Angry Mob, Kaylin Wood, King Tone, Kyle Hashman, Matt McKay, R.A., Ryan Hubbard, Scott Martin, Stay Fresh Cheese Bags, Your Friendly Neighborhood Window Peeper, Zach Spring, Andrew Bohan, Sam Bankson, Adam I Wish I Could Finish Like Ernie, Antonio Gracias, Anto- uh, Babe Landeskog, Ben Barron, uh, Brad's dad moan, Connor Leighton, Dave W, Eric Sinkowski, Evans bingo card. I'm so blazed, dude. I don't know what to put here. James Laporte, Jeremiah Dobo. Was that your stomach? Whoa. Oh boy. Jeremy Brocker, John Evans, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Logan Stahl, Matt Keeler, Matt S, Max $1 million, Reed, Ravi DeLuca, Terry Actual, Trevor Pevavar, Zach Handyside, and Zach McCann, a driving range superstar. Thank you all so much. We'll talk to you Thursday. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.